thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, present uh, Nomad um, V3 to you. Um, I, you know what, I'll just start with just introducing myself. I prepared a slide for this, so I'll just go. So my name is Lauren Pancholi. I am originally from Switzerland, and my background uh, was in master's in computer science. Then I did a PhD in genetics in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, I studied um, genome mutations in um, this uh, Genome of the Netherlands project, which was a big whole genome sequencing project at the time with 250 trios. Um, so um, it has gone a long way since then. Um, and for the last uh, four years now, I've been a postdoctoral fellow at MGH and the Boat Institute in um, Daniel MacArthur's lab. And the main project I've been working on is NOMAD. So um, along with uh, Conrad uh, Karczewski and Grace Tiao, we've put together the NOMAD V2 version. And um, the NOMAD V3 uh, was mostly uh, myself and then uh, Chris Vittel. Uh, um, and so that's what I'm presenting. And the background here is essentially my hometown. And on the foreground, you can see the BFL um, uh, where I did my, my master's. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad to uh, be presenting this. Um, please interrupt me at any time if you have any questions. Uh, I also hope that you'll, you know, find it interesting and that it'll help you uh, with um, using this resource. So. Let's start. Okay, let's see. All right. Let's start with just you know, I mean, this is pretty obvious for everyone on the call, I'm sure. But why why are we building Nomad? Um, reason is that uh, having precise allele frequency is uh, key information in a, a first of all a, a variant uh, in knowing um, you know the possible selection pressure that is um, uh, operating on the variant. Obviously, there are many rare variants that have no selection pressure on them, but the, the converse is not true, that there are not many common variants that have uh, uh, high selection pressure on them. Uh, and similarly, as an aggregate, uh, the allele frequency spectrum within a gene or within any functional region of the genome, for that matter, uh, is also a good indicator of uh, the selection pressure that is going on in this uh, functional region. And so, um, since there are um, a lot of uh, samples that have been sequenced in the whole exome, a whole genome, um, the idea behind NOMAD is obviously that uh, instead of having this information siloed by projects um, and only accessible um, to a few investigators, we take the task of uh, gathering all of these data, processing it in a uh, an, with a single pipeline to try and minimize batch effects, and then release this information uh, in aggregate to the community, um, so that the LE frequency uh, information is available to everyone. Um, so no is uh, I just wanted to you know show this slide because this is kind of the starting point and then jump v3 uh, so that was uh, you know a release with a hundred and forty thousand um, samples and uh, one of the characteristics is that it's really exomes intense um, at the time we only had about sixteen uh, thousand genomes and on the right side, at the, at the top, you can see the breakdown by population uh, uh, for the genomes. And as is evident, it's really mostly a good resource for uh, Europeans. Um, and I would say like a decent resource probably for uh, African-American populations. But the ones that we had really, uh, really little um, representation of other ancestries. Um, that was one of the... Uh, I think pitfalls and just overall 15,000 genomes, uh, while a large number uh, is still fairly small uh, when you want to distinguish between, uh, you know, your really rare alleles and the alleles that are you know, appearing in one in a thousand, for example. Um, and these data were uh, mapped and called on the uh, build 37 of the human genome. Uh, which has been supplanted now for a few years by Build38, but um, 
um, here at the Broad, and I think in many other places, we're a bit lagging behind um, this uh, version switch because it's expensive to reprocess all of these data and map them to the new build of the genome. So it's something we sort of all agree we have to do, but um, you know we have other priorities as well, and um, you know, we've been training a little. Um, so I just want to highlight a few things about um, genomes versus exomes because the Nomad B3 release is really all uh, about uh, genomes. Um, and so obviously one of the upsides of the genomes is that it does capture the non-coding variation. It also captures variation in a few more coding regions and the plot that you see on the right hand side sort of illustrate this. So every dot on the plot is an exon. And um, the uh, x-axis, proportion of bases are well covered in the exomes, and the y-axis shows the proportion of bases well covered in the genomes. Um, and um, the two curves show the uh, marginal densities. And so what you can see is that um, obviously the bulk of the exomes are well covered by, uh, by the uh, exomes. But there are a you know there are a non-negligible number of exons that aren't. And so if you just kind of focus on the areas that are the least well covered, um, you can see that you know anywhere between five and fifteen percent uh, of the exons are actually not that well covered um, by the exons in Nomad, uh, but are well covered. It allows the genomes, looking at the genomes, not only allow us to have a better representative coding region, but also allow us to access a few of these regions that are hard to capture with the um, exome. Um, it also allows, of course, for structural variant detection. Um, and so I'm sure, as you're aware, uh, we now have uh, structural variants in the Nomad browser for the V2 release. Uh, and uh, the a team here uh, led by uh, Ryan Collins and Mike Takowski's group is leading the charge on extending this to uh, the V3 call set. So this is something that will be um, available in the, you know, somewhat short term future. Let's say, let's say you know, I, I, my, I, I guess a good estimate mid, mid 2020. Um, and then the last part is that the data can be phased much more robust. Um, in the V2 data, it's not something we've um, been uh, exploring a whole lot, but for the V3 data, um, for um, reasons that become apparent actually in probably the next slide, um, we'd want to uh, do a bit more phasing, especially in admixed individuals, um, with the goal of resolving uh, the ancestry by haplotype, so that we can distinguish uh, alleles that are coming from, uh, you know, say, in an African American uh, sample, the alleles that are coming from European versus African ancestors um, to be able to give allele frequencies that are uh, better tailored to the population. So, sort of give a, a you know an African um, haplotypes allele frequency, because right now our admixed samples are obviously uh, part of a cline, um, and some have a lot of um, African ancestry, and others have. And so right now it's a bit of a, an average, I suppose. That we're... Um, so this is the Nomad B3 at a glance. Uh, so it's uh, 700 million variants uh, that were found in 71,000 whole genomes. It was mapped to uh, the new build of the genome, so build 38. And I did a substantial amount of uh, checks when we moved from the build 37 to the build 38. Nomad was essentially the first call set of the broads to be mapped to build 38. Um, I had to look whether um, you know, the switch in build uh, looked reasonable. Um, and so for this, fortunately, we have essentially most of the genomes in V2 are also in V3. And so I could look at um, you know, what variants we're finding, where we're finding it, whether the genotypes are component, and that sort of things. Um, and so um, based on this, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're really confident that um, our build 38 pipeline works well, and that this um, 
Little Man D3 should be a, a really good resource for anyone who is looking at the build period of the, the genome. We've also updated our transcripts model to, the, to gene code version 29. Um, I believe the gene code version used in uh, D2 is 19, so it was quite a few versions behind. Um, there are multiple reasons for this. One of them is that um, we had to update our, um, our VET pipeline, which unfortunately is a big endeavor, uh, and obviously update the browser and everything. So uh, the transcript that you'll see on the browser and the VEP annotations that are on the browser for Nomad V3 are now updated to gene code uh, 29, which hopefully is a, a good improvement on um, on the, the previous build. So, that's this. Um, and then on the right hand side uh, are the populations that are um, in, um, in these genomes, as well as the increase from the V2 genomes. And um, as you can see, there is being a, uh, a pretty substantial increase in um, the non European populations, which we are uh, very happy about. So we've got five times as many African American uh, genomes um, that we had in the V2 genomes. And actually, that's even if we bundle up the genomes and the exomes in V2, uh, we still have about 2x increase in V3. Uh, so this is a really gain uh, for this population. And so for anyone who is looking at um, variants or genes that are um, in, in African Americans, um, V3 should now uh, be the best resource for this. Um, and then we have a very nice increase as well in the uh, Latino mixed uh, uh, samples uh, and um, pretty good increase in like, you know, overall, of course. Um, we also have um, a couple of new uh, populations. So we have now the frequencies for uh, the Amish population. We only have 450 samples here in the because this is a population that is pretty heavily bottlenecked. Um, the 450 actually come from a much larger uh, sample size, but once we prune them to remove uh, related samples, uh, we only find these many. So. Hopefully, this should be a, you know, um, a, uh, a, a fairly good representation for this population. And then uh, South Asians, which we had for exomes in V2, but not in genomes. So uh, yeah, overall, a pretty nice uh, increase, not only in sample sites, but also in uh, diversity of ancestries. Um, I wanted to mention some of the important contributors to Nomad V3 because I know one of the uh, one of the questions you had was about the overlap with respect to two, and so I thought that you probably want to know a bit about overlap with other projects. Um, so as you can see, there's a, a substantial amount; almost half of our samples are actually from one of the TopMed projects. So if you are, are also looking at TopMed as a resource. Uh, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, then uh, we have 21,000 samples that are coming from the uh, common disease, uh, the CCDG, so the common, whatever, whatever this stands for, common disease initiative. Um, then we have about 14,000 samples that are uh, so either from uh, the Global, Psych Global Psychiatry Consortium, GPC, or from uh, here, the Stanley Center at the Broad Institute. Uh, we have 2,000 samples that come from VA. These are all uh, the uh, normal sample, right? So not the tumor sample. Um, and then we have uh, almost 800 samples that are from GTEx. Yes, I heard something. Okay, so I'll just keep on going then. Um, and so now I, I just want to go a little, you know, a little bit about how we uh, created this um, this resource um, and some of the technical improvements we had to make. 
um, so that you can, I guess, get a bit of a bit of perspective on um, some of the challenges that um, that we had. Um, so, a, so, oops. So just start by saying that the and 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 I'll come back to it in in a few slides that the the call set we actually created uh, for Normal D3 uh, was a hundred and forty eight uh, thousand uh, whole genomes, um, and then we had to remove uh, uh, essentially half of these samples, most of them because um, they come from cohorts that we cannot release. Um, but it was a major effort to um, create this set from. 148,000 genomes, and we had to develop a bunch of new methods for this. Um, here, what the graphs uh, the graph shows is um, on the x-axis the number of whole whole genome samples, and on the y-axis the size of the data in, um, in terabytes. And the blue diamonds is the data representation that we had for um, uh, Nomad D2. Uh, which is quite similar to what you'd have uh, in a uh, VCF that has been GZIP. Um, and so you can see that for Nomad V2, we had uh, those uh, thousand samples and we had about 30 uh, terabytes of data. And if we had extrapolated this to 148,000, uh, this would now be 900 terabytes. Of data. And 900 terabytes of data co costs $18,000. Um, to store on the Google Cloud right now. Um, so these costs would have been really prohibitive. Uh, and these are just the- uh, not with it working. Sorry? Are you guys- I think we're just getting head? some back. Yeah, we can hear you. I think we're just getting some feedback. Sorry, Lauren. If you all can please just mute yourself, we'd appreciate it if you can continue, Lauren. Thank you. All right, yeah, no worries. Um, which is obviously prohibitive. And so uh, we essentially built a new data format. And so um, um, uh, familiar with the GDCF format, which is a, a, a format. Um, there's also a comparison of this, where is the little green triangles. And so you can see for 100,000 samples, you're about 100 teras of data if you just sum the GDCFs. And what we have achieved is actually to be at 40 teras for um, the uh, 148,000 samples. Um, and this actually scales sublinearly. So um, this, you know, with, with this, we're, we are at least good till we reach um, sample sizes in the few millions. Um, so there was a major improvement and how this was, um, how this was achieved was by um, creating this sparse format um, which somewhat comparable to concatenating, concatenating a bunch of, of GVCFs, at least conceptually. And it's sparse in the sense that the homozygous reference information uh, only appear once per, um, we call them blocks of uh, similar quality. So um, it is not repeated every time that you have a variant like you'd have in a VCF file. Um, and again, like, I'm not sure how many on the call are like super, um, Having you with BCF and GVCF, I just wanted to uh, let you know about this improvement and um, uh, uh, you know, highlight a few things that this has allowed us to do. So the first thing, of course, is that it reduces the data size massively. Um, secondly, it preserves information about non-reference alleles, uh, about all of the non-reference alleles. Prior to this, um, we essentially only reported six non-reference per uh, position maximum. It's not a big, uh, I mean, this is not a, you know, a, a much of a win it is. Uh, probably a lot of the much more multi allelic are just difficult position in the genome. Um, but it's nevertheless good that we can uh, preserve this information. Um, that there's no loss of information. It also preserve the <clears throat> reference information throughout the entire genome rather than only at sites which are a polymorphic in uh, a given sample. And so this allows appending round samples. Yes? I, sorry, so I, I heard something, but. All right. 
Should I? I think I think it's just still some feedback. All right, good. Okay, I'll just keep going then. Um, and it also allows us to compute coverage directly on these data. Um, so the coverage that you see in the uh, Nomad V3 browser um, was actually computed from this data and not from the BAM files. Uh, it does mean that there's a little bit of smoothing uh, going on, um, but uh, we've done a bunch of tests and that for um, the use that we have in the Nomad browser, this works extremely well. Um, and because um, it's um, average over um, so many samples, um, this is the, on the plus side, we can actually now do this on all um, uh, samples in the release, so all 71,000 samples in the release, whereas before we would randomly select 10% uh, uh, of the samples um, to do this because it was so expensive to go back to the BAM files. Um, so all in all, it does seem like um, this is a, a pretty good win um, for the uh, uh, coverage, um, at least for the genomes. And then preserve detailed quality metrics at each of the non-reference genotype. And so this means that um, with our quality information from GATK to um, uh, our frame, uh, which I haven't named yet, but it's called HAIL. Um, and um, and it's, it's a framework that is uh, developed here at the roads um, and that can um, scale and parallelize so we've essentially shifted a couple of things from GATK into HALO. So now GATK is used essentially all the way through single sample GVCF production. Uh, and then we go into HALO and do um, essentially the rest of the things in HALO. Okay, um, I'll just quickly you know, uh, walk you through um, the data. Um, so, um, first the sample QC, so um, the first step was removing the samples that were in the call set, but we were not allowed to release. Um, so one thing you may, or may not know is that when we um, uh, create a nomad call set, we are very opportunistic in using as many samples as we can, and typically um, some of the projects take a bit longer um, to tell us whether we can or cannot release their samples. Um, most of the time, PIs are very interested in getting their data called jointly with Nomad, so they want their data to be in the call set, they're just not sure whether they are ready to share it with the you know, rest of the community. Uh, and so unfortunately for this round, um, there were a lot of samples we could either did not get the permission Set from 148,000 to um, 84,000. Uh, I should point out that there are also a number of cohorts in there that are rare disease cohorts um, that we do not want to. Um, so we just flag them as non releasable because uh, we do not want any uh, rare disease cohort in our, uh, our data. Uh, the first filter we applied after this is the, uh, it's just a bunch of hard filters. Uh, these are just essentially very crude. Um, you know, quality um, filters that are meant to just remove samples that are very obviously bad. Uh, so samples that have, for example, very low coverage um, or that have a totally aberrant number of volumes, that type of things. Um, um, and then we go into the more sort of refined sample QC process. Um, so the first um, part of this is looking at the um, sex aneuploidies. Um, and so to do this, this time, because we had this uh, coverage information across the whole genome, uh, we could look at the uh, coverage of uh, or our individuals on chromosome X and Y, and then we normalized it by chromosome, uh, the coverage on chromosome 20, because, uh, you know, some of these samples were sequenced at 20x coverage, other at 30x coverage, and so you have to do this normalization step uh, in order to get the deploidy. Um, and so what this shows is, you know, um, pretty clear uh, male and female cluster and then a few aneuploidies and, you know, some gradient in between that would just sort of uh, label as ambiguous. And I'll point out that there is a 
this sort of down spike in the males here uh, on that red, you know, that red uh, uh, cluster looks like an arrow a little bit. And so that down spike here, we looked at it, and uh, these are uh, very consistent with uh, loss of Y um, in, in older males. And so for some of these, we had uh, age information. And uh, when we look at it, we can see trend uh, with respect to lower uh, Y cover coverage um, and age. And so uh, we decided to include that down spike because it was very consistent uh, with uh, you know, males that have a loss of Y to A. All right, um, then I don't have a graph for this, unfortunately, but we, uh, the relatedness between our samples, as you may be aware, we do not allow any sample with uh, a two uh, degrees, um, sorry, any sample that is, <clears throat> that is uh, to uh, closer than um, second degree or closer into NOMAD. Sorry, this is an awkward, essentially, all first and second degree releases were pruned out. Uh, and so it turns out that we do have a lot of, uh, of trios in um, our row full sets and um, also a, a whole bunch of second degree relatives. And so we lost uh, 6,000 uh, samples of them. They're not entirely lost in that the trios are very useful for uh, quality control purpose, um, but still, it's still a sizable number of samples that had to be dropped. Um, then we assign ancestry. Uh, there's no, you know, specific QC uh, operation that uses ancestry uh, uh, anymore. I'll, I'll, I'll speak about the last step of the QC um, in this plot, but this is just showing on our classical, um, you know, uh, principal component analysis on a uh, relatively common, so point uh, one person or more. Uh, in the global data um, and that are really well, you know, genotyped in all of the samples. Um, and what we see is what exactly what we expect. Um, this is just showing PC1 and PC2. So PC1 uh, really separates um, the uh, African Americans uh, from the rest of the samples. It's pretty clear that this is a client. So that, that's what I was uh, speaking about, those samples that are in that uh, purple cloud on the very left of it have mostly um, African um, ancestry um, and those on the left have much less African uh, ancestry. Um, and all in all, this is really serious, but um, because we have to, or well, because we want to label um, things right now uh, based on the entire genetic content of the sample in terms of ancestry, um, this is the sort of Daniel, uh, how, how we, we set the limits. Um, and then uh, you can see PC2 that separates the East Asians uh, uh, from the rest. There are other PCs that separate really well all of the other populations. Uh, but already, if you just color them on these uh, coordinates, you can see that they mostly cluster, cluster nicely and tightly uh, with each other. Uh, perhaps with the exception from the Latino samples, which on these two a bigger blob than uh, on some other uh, pieces. Um, and so, so the last step that we did uh, in terms of sample QC is a bunch of QC metrics. These include things like the number of SNPs, uh, the transition to transversion ratio, the number of singletons, um, the um, ratio, the homozygosity within the samples, and so on. And um, for NOMAD V2, how we had done this is that we first had assigned labels for each of the populations. And then for each population, uh, we excluded, um, I think, four, yeah, four uh, median absolute deviations from the, uh, on each side of the distribution. And so the problem with this approach was that a client like the African Americans, uh, although they all get lumped together, for, they were all getting together for this uh, purpose. Um, you know, 
one on one side of the cli client and on the other side of the client are uh, very different uh, from each other. And a second problem with this approach is that any sample that was not a sample population was lumped with all of the other samples um, that weren't assigned a population. And, um, and then they were just like a big mixed bag. And this, uh, this, this QC step didn't work really well because it was a mixed bag. The median absolute deviations were really big. And so essentially, we were much less training samples that we couldn't assign ancestry for uh, than on those that we could. Um, and essentially, the more, the less diversity within one population, the more stringent we were. Um, so we shifted to a different approach where we take all of the samples together. And instead of considering the, uh, for example, here in the example, the number of SNPs, uh, what we do is we first uh, regress the, uh, the principal components. Uh, so in this case, the 10 first principal components from uh, this, these metrics. And then uh, we look at the distribution of residuals and uh, we exclude samples based on certain deviations from uh, the median of the residuals. Um, and so um, if you look at these plots, the, the previous approach, most of the plots look like this. Um, so in this case, you can see that there is a main distribution and then there is a, some small lump on the left that was getting cut. It wasn't clear whether that small lump was due to a slightly different ancestry um, than, the, you know, than the main peak or whether it was really something of an, an error mode. Uh, with a new approach, uh, you know, by regressing the, the uh, principal components, this is a continuous, uh, a continuous metric. And so what we get is much tighter distributions with um, essentially, you know, no, uh, no, uh, we, we, uh, and so uh, we believe that this was a much improved, um, a, a, a much improved uh, way of doing things. Um, and so after this last step, we have 71,702 samples that went into the NOMAD V3.0. Just a few words on variant QC. Variant QC uh, for this round, we didn't uh, go into, uh, we, di we, we didn't develop as many methods as for V2. We actually sort of went back to using uh, VQSR, um, so this is the GTK volume quality score calibration. The reason why we went back to it is twofold. First, uh, there is now a specific version of uh, VQSR. So it is a version that actually um, creates models based on each allele rather than each uh, site. Uh, one of the main pitfalls of the previous version of VQSR is that if you had a multi allelic site, we see a common and a rare variant, they'd get bundled up together. Uh, all of their metrics would get bundled up together and they would consider once, you know, a single thing. Um, whereas now um, there, there are two different entries in the model. And one of the main um, technical improvements that we had done with uh, the V2 was actually to use an, an alien specific model. And so here you can, um, you know, see the curves here, uh, VQSR is the blue, so that is the, you know, traditional GTK approach, and the other VQSR is uh, are the green and uh, orange curves, and the difference between... This is Deb. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not seeing uh, any curves right now on the screen. Is, is it just me? I think there are a few other people who are having some issues and it might be your connectivity. Right now I can see variant QC and now sample QC and I just saw the switch. Like flipping, so like, yeah, just flip so it's uh, it I, I can see the screen. Okay. Now? I said that I could see the uh, slides, so. You can see the slide? Okay. I mean, I, I don't think it matters too much. See the slides. Essentially, it's uh, it shows the precision and recall on any one two eight seven eight, uh, both for SNPs and SNPs. And what it shows is really just that um, using this allele specific model performs a whole bunch better than uh, the classical VQSR. Um, and so this is not very surprising. This is something that we had created based on the Nomad V two results. 
For Nomad V2, we had used a, a different model. Um, the problem is that we have to update this model uh, for the newer version of Hale, and this is a bit time consuming, so we are still doing it. And to be honest, our expectation is that it's going to perform very much like the other. We don't expect it to perform much better because the main reason why was because it was considering each allele specifically. Okay, can everyone see this? Back to uh, normal V3 at a glance. So this is just to reiterate that this is you know what we've produced far. Um, and um, only have a few minutes left, but that's perfect because my next slide is just the next steps. Um, so um, we are going to produce a bunch of subsets. Uh, I was hoping that it would be ready by the end of the year, but I think it might drag on into January, just based on uh, how much work we have right now. Here are three subsets that are easy for us to produce and would be, I think, of uh, great use to the community. The first one is a subset of the V2 data that does not include V3, um, so that they could be easily put together. Um, so just to be clear, in terms of genomes, essentially all of the V2 genomes are in V3. So V3 can be considered a superset of V2 genomes. Now, there are a bunch of exomes in the V2 that have now been sequenced as genomes that are present in the V3 genomes. Um, some examples of this would be the GTEx samples, for example. Um, but we are not sure exactly how many, how many samples this concerns. Uh, and so this is something that we want to provide the community is essentially a good way of saying, you know, this is a V2 call set that you can use with V3 and be overlapping samples and also no related samples between the two sets. Um, so that's our, and I think that's sort of the highest priority right now uh, in terms of new release. Um, we also want to uh, release a V3 that is non top med so that similarly you can uh, you can then, um, you know, add the two together rather than um, not knowing whether um, the samples are overlapping. And then a non-cancer uh, data, so just removing those 2,000 samples from uh, that are coming from TCGA. This is a request that we get rather often. Um, then there are two things that um, if you've looked at the NOAA browser with the V3 release, you've for sure noticed. First, there is no constraint scores. We are now working on making Constraint really a part of our release pipeline. So you know, next release is, it just comes with the release right now. There's unfortunately a bunch of, you know, manual um, steps that have been, uh, that, that has, have to be taken before a uh, release Constraint and that really um, should disappear in the next releases. And so we're working on this. And similarly, there is no uh, text score. So this is the score um, that was developed um, by uh, Burial Cummings in our group um, that essentially shows whether, you know, any variant is on a transcript that is actually expressed um, in any tissue. And then a little bit longer term, but we really want to phase the admix and provide not just a little frequency in, say, African-American, but really provide, you know, a little frequency in the African haplotypes of the African American, and similarly, uh, not the admix, the frequency, any frequency in uh, Latino only, but the any frequency in the the native uh, American um, haplotypes of the Latino population. Sort of longer term goal, and we'll have to see exactly you know how much precision we can give and how 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 to present this data. But the the hope is that in the longer term, if you have an admixed sample you'd want to disambiguate uh, uh, the, the haplotypes better sense of uh, the early frequencies by, um, by the, the haplotypic. Okay, so this is, this is what I had, and I'm uh, obviously very happy to answer you know, any questions you might have. Um, hopefully this was you know, useful. Um, that's what I had. Yes, thank you, Lauren. Does anyone have any questions?
No, well, we may move on because we do have a little bit of time, Lauren, for an update. Um, but I saw something please go ahead. Oh, okay, it's in the chat. Yeah. Um, it on. says, yes. what? what is the state of efforts to remove somatic violence to hematopoietic? So, <laughs> um, this actually, so the, this this topic as a, uh, from one of the reviewers on our uh, Nomad V2 paper, which is currently uh, in bioarchive. And so for V2, we did, you know, we, we, we did look um, exome wide at how, you know, what, what, how bad this problem was. Uh, and essentially we could not find any new, interesting, unexpected genes um, that were showing this behavior at all. Um, and uh, we did, on the other hand, of course, find this behavior in, in genes where we would expect it. Um, I don't think there's anything on our plate right now um, to um, really ad address this, I would say. Um, I think we're thinking of, you know, adding tags so that if anyone is not familiar with uh, you know, a gene where this might be the case, um, they would be made aware. So that, that is something that we are um, thinking about. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you feel like this is an important thing to do, I mean, we, we, we are always welcome, uh, welcoming you know, suggestions and about things you'd like to see. So. I think the, yeah, the answer is more of a flag than a filter, I guess. Um, and probably, at least in the first phase, will be only applied to where um, this behavior is actually expected. So that, so there is not 